All right, so award season is upon us, and we got the Nebula nominations last week while I was out of town, and I thought I would discuss what I thought about them, which ones I might try and read, which ones I think might also make it on the Hugo shortlist, stuff like that. And like I talked about when I did my Hugo winner reaction video last year, which I'll link down below if you want to see it, awards are interesting because they measure something, but I don't think they measure what we think they measure sometimes. I think this one people generally have a better idea of, but... This is voted on by members, I think it's the SFWA membership, and that means you are, I think, a writer or editor involved in the publishing of books, I think. I don't know if it's just writers and authors or more than that, but unlike the Hugos, we're just like anyone who wants to spend $50 can become a member. This is more exclusive. There are 2,000 members, and they are authors, and so that has any biases that you want to associate with that. Like, the fact that authors are friends with each other, right? Like... <laughs> That is probably something that does exist. I mean, whether you're friends with someone means you're just more likely to maybe pick up their book. You know, that just means that that book's just more on your radar and stuff like that. So are these the best books? Who knows? I mean, I don't even know how you would objectively measure that anyways, but these are the books that around 2,000 people nominated. And so we're going to start with the novels. Some of these are not surprising, and I definitely foresee them being on the Hugo's nominations and some that I was already tentatively planning to read because I just figured these were so buzzy and so buzzy in these communities that I would have to read them, <laughs> at least for my completionist brain. So for the novels, we have Legends and Lattes, which I do have plans to read. I'm going to read it. <laughs> this is, if you somehow have not heard, this, I mean, it was like the 2022 book. Um, cozy, low stakes fantasy, starting a coffee shop in like a D&D inspired type world. Lots of people have been resonating with this low stakes book. I am excited to try it out. We'll see if it works for me. Sometimes Kiss of Death is when people describe books as warm hug of a book. But this story has such a fun trajectory because it started off as indie published by an author who is a audiobook narrator. I I think the one he's probably most known for is the Cradle series by Will White, which is also indie pubbed. And so it started off indie pubbed and it got pushed. That tour picked it up. And recently the prequel, I think it's a prequel, another book in that world. I think it's a prequel was announced. So it's kind of just nice to see a book succeed that way, vi like primarily through word of mouth and stuff like that. It's just nice. Um, so curious about that one. Another one that is on my, I'm going to read it, but I'm very nervous is Babel. Bab I think I say Babel. I don't even know how to say it the other way. Um, by Arf Kwong. This is the, I don't know, literary dark academia fantasy book. I don't know. I don't know if it fits any of those genres very perfectly because I know it's pretty low magic and the magic is definitely more of a metaphor for translation. I've seen people love this. I've seen people be okay with this. I've seen this not work for people and I'm very nervous for myself because I am a jaded academic, like truly. <laughs> So we'll see, but I'm really not surprised. It was so hyped and just not shocked that it's on this list. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was on the Hugos. Um, another one I haven't read that I've been curious about, and I didn't know if it would be a novel length or novella because it's based off word count, whether you're a no novel or novella, not page count. So that's Spear, which I talked about on my recent release roundups last year. So it's on my radar. I know it's gender bent King Arthur related. I know very little about King Arthur legends. Like I know the, the gist, like, and I've watched, you know, the sword and the stone, you know, the animated Disney movie, which I know takes liberties. And I've seen it involved in other fantasy I've read. Like I've read the Finnevar tapestry years ago and it's King Arthur is ever present in things, but do I know it very well? No, no, I don't. So I don't know who this is gender bent on. I think actually that's part of the intrigue of the story as well is like, you don't quite know for a while who you're hearing the story of until like a reveal, but I've heard only fantastic things and I see it at the store and I think about it. So I was expecting to have to read this for either the novel or novella for the Hugos because I assumed it would be nominated for the novella if it qualified, but it, apparently it is a novel length and here it is. So I'm excited because like I do want to read it. I don't know if I'll read it in time for Hugo nominations. I might just like assume it'll make it over there or maybe later when I'm reading like my novels for the Hugos and novellas for the Hugos I might throw in some nebulas like I did last time and see how that works out. But I'm excited that it's here. Um, I think the other one that I know of but I haven't read and I'm I'm not gonna read. <laughs> I mean maybe one day but not anytime soon and that is Nona the Ninth by Tamsin Muir, book three and Gideon the Ninth. People who are involved in like the award space love the series. It is a darling. <laughs> um, I think, I think the fourth book comes out this year. And if it does, I will see if the fans like the ending. 
because if the fans don't like the ending, I'm not going to try. <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just not. I'm going to hope that the fans like the ending. I'm going to assume that the fandom is going to be like, yes, oh, this is just such a good series. I can't go wait to go back and reread it because it is kind of convoluted. But if that's what happens, I'm going to pick up the audiobooks because I've heard fantastic things and I'm going to try it then. But as of now, having only read Gideon the Ninth and I have like a really old review of that from when I first started the channel in 2020, I am fine for now. <laughs> and I will wait to hear hear people report back on, is it Lecto or something? I don't know, the fourth book. And so there's one on here that I knew nothing about, so I had to look it up. And it actually has like for a fantasy release, not like too few ratings or anything like that, like nothing compared to Babel or something, but it's The Mountain in the Sea by Ray Naylor. And I was looking up this author because like I truly have knew nothing about this book. And for me, when I, you know, do my recent release roundups, that's kind of rare these days. And I go to my bookstore like every other week. So like, I usually see a lot of new releases. Um, this author actually, this is, uh, I think, I think his first novel and primarily was writing a lot of short works for like Clark's World and stuff like that. So it makes more sense to me that he might like know people who vote for this or nominate for this, who might've picked up his work if he has friends who would be more likely to like pick it up and then nominate it for this. Like that's like what I think happened with Plague Bird last year because that's another book that was nominated for the Nebula that I knew nothing about, but I think is like a friend of a lot of authors. That doesn't mean the book's bad. It just means that, like, like I said, when you have, like, this pool of 2,000 people, if more of them are likely to pick up the book, you know, you just have a better chance versus me, I guess, it really didn't come to my radar. But what's it about? Because I did look this up. I haven't really talked about what the other ones are about, I don't think, but I'm just going to put this one on your radar because I feel like the other ones are just so popular. Um, this is a near future thriller about the nature of consciousness. Specifically, we discover a very, very sentient strain, strain is not the right word, species of octopuses. And octopuses are like kind of known to be very intelligent in ways that we don't know how to measure. Like the way their brains work is not synonymous or, you know, it's not parallel to how our brains work, but they are actually considered to be quite intelligent creatures. And I guess this is exploring, well, we have a very sentient form and what does that do? And it's apparently supposed to be like a thriller sci-fi, so I'm curious about it. I don't know if I'll pick it up, but it's kind of cool that it was on the radar. And then the one that I have read that was on this list, the only one I have read, was Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher, which I adore. I adore that book. So I'm very happy it's here. I'm hoping it'll make a Hugo nomination. I mean, I think I'm going to. I haven't filmed that video yet. I want to wait till closer. Sometime in April, I'll drop my things I'm going to nominate for the Hugos video. <laughs> but Nettle and Bone, man. Ah. <sighs> It's just so fun. Just such a good time. So that's my thoughts on the novels. We're only gonna do novels and novellas and I'll talk about that I read two of the novelettes, which is shocking. I've like, novelettes are like the weird space between short stories and novellas and like, you really only can get them in some anthologies and in magazines. So you have to like really look for them, I think more so. Um, but I actually did read two of them. So I'll, I'll mention the two I read, but I'm not like looking up synopses for all the short stories and novelettes because they're not like good reads. It's kind of hard. But for the novellas, we have unsurprisingly, and this is definitely going to be nominated for the Hugos, A Prayer for the Crown Shine. And I do think for my reading the novellas for the Hugos, this is one I'll be f forced is not the right word, encouraged <laughs> to read. I have read the first book. I did that last year. I liked it, but I didn't love it. It didn't quite hit me the way it does other people. And I think it's because my mental health didn't need that messaging, but I might, I might align more with the messaging in this one, which is, I think like the first one is about, do you need a purpose? Like what is, what is the point of the purpose? How does the purpose serve you? And I think the second one is about, at least I've heard it from content creators. It's like the idea of does everything you have to do have to have worth and monetization type quality, like something synonymous with that, I think. And that might align more with me. Another one that I actually just read last night because I saw it here and it's a Clark wor Clark's World story and they have a Spotify and you can listen to their podcast. And I'm like, I couldn't find a synopsis for this. And I like this author. And I was like, well, it's only an hour to listen to. So I was crocheting and listened to it last night. And that's Bishop's Opening by RSA Garcia. Um, they are, I believe... They're a Caribbean author, and I think it's Trinidad, where she's from. Um, and I think they use she, they pronouns. I'm not positive. I'll put RSA Garcia's pronouns on the screen because I feel like I am only partially right. But regardless, this story was very interesting. Um, it took me a while to get into it, but we have basically two groups of perspectives from two different cultural situations. We have a ship of three people in a polyamorous relationship who are traveling to a, a really large spaceport and their goal is to go 
try this food that is related to one of the people's family and stuff like that. And in the process, they intersect with our other storyline, which is this person who is part of this culture that is very hierarchically rigid, very cruel, no emotion and stuff like that. It's just very politically driven. And we have someone, and we don't really ever learn the whole backstory of him, but Bishop, like it's all the hierarchy is based on chess pieces, um, is trying to work for his best interest. And we have a sense that something happened in his past and we don't really know what. And through circumstances, one of our characters, I think his name's Sebastian, saves the life of Bishop, but it also involves them being taken by this kind of like harsh culture onto their ship and there's some tension there and it unravels in quite a sweet way. I don't know if this will stick with me, but I'm glad I listened to it. It was really nice. And this was just a nice reminder that there are other works by this author I've been wanting to try out because I first read them in Sunspot Jungle two years ago. I think a short story with um, Shannon because we read a lot of anthologies together. Um, one I haven't heard of is I Never Liked You Anyway by Jordan Curella. And this is apparently, uh, so it's a Eurydice retelling, Eurydice um, Orpheus, and Eurydice dies like, you know, she normally does in her story, and it's, she's sent to hell. And in this version, hell is a school, and you have to pass all your classes to then enter hell, I think. And in this story, she doesn't want to be saved um, by Orpheus. And we don't really know why, and she's also failing her classes. I don't really know what the tone of this is. It doesn't have that many ratings, but like... It's interesting. I guess it's a different take, you know, especially with like Hades Town around and then the um, Hades game. Like people have had these characters on their mind for a while recently. Um, so I don't know. That's there. And then one that I have read recently, even though I knew the end, really good. And C.L. Polk tends to be nominated a lot for the Nebula and the Hugos. Um, so I'm not really surprised. She's, I mean, they're an author definitely worth reading and I'm excited to read more of their works. Um, but this was lovely. Um, I think it was actually of all the novella, I mean, I've only read Bishop's opening on this list, but I'm pretty bad at finding novellas that work for me in terms of like length and pacing and stuff. And I thought this was really well paced and was the perfect length for a novella. I didn't feel like I needed more. I didn't feel like we lingered too long in other places or that it moved too quickly. I thought it was really well done. Um, I'll link my wrap up down below if you want more of my thoughts on it. But this is a story about a detective in 1940s Chicago who knows that their time is running out because of a Faustian deal that they made with a demon devil in the past, and they're given an opportunity to maybe win their soul back. And it's about where that story goes. And it's got a lovely relationship, and I don't know, like I said, I just thought it was paced incredibly well. The last novella on this list is High Times in the Low Parliament. I've seen this book. Um, at the bookstore, but it looks a lot like a different novel. Like it has the same art style. I'll put the novel on the screen. So this and this, they, they look similar to me, different authors. I think the same publisher. Um, regardless, High Times and Low Parliament is about a scribe, a very good scribe who does a deal and something goes wrong. And so then the fairy send her to be a scribe in Low Parliament as like punishment, trickery. I don't really know the situation, but she's stuck there. And during this time, she and a couple people are going to be this unlikely group to try and prevent a war with the humans, I think. So it seems very political, very ragtag group. I don't know. It, like, this has not intrigued me. I know my friend bought a copy when we went to the bookstore when she was visiting me, but I don't think she's read it yet. So I'll be curious to see if this gets nominated for um, the Hugos and then maybe I'll read it. I don't know. But like looking at the synopsis, I'm like, I don't, I don't know if this is for me. But those are my general thoughts and impressions on the novels and novellas. And we can quickly go through some of the other categories. So novelette, there are two I read and one I was going to nominate, so made me feel happy. And that is If You Find Yourself Speaking to God, Aggress God with the Informal You by John Chu. This was so precious, guys. And it's for free on a podcast for the Uncanny Magazine. You can definitely go check it out there. I loved it. Um, <laughs> There's like a superhero and it's, it's very, you know, Superman. And our main character thinks that he, his gym partner at the gym is the superhero. And it's, I, I don't know how to describe it. It also discusses a lot of, about Asian hate, um, body dysmorphia among people who like work out a lot. It was lovely. I, I listened to this on my way to work and I was completely captured and that was months ago. And I still smile when I think about this story. And yeah, it's just really well told. I'm so glad to see it here because it was wonderful. Um, the only, there's one written by S.B. Divya. I haven't read it, but I'm curious because I really liked Machine Hood, which was her debut novel. Um, S.L. Wong had one, which again, curious about because I've read a novella by her. Well, them, they use any pronouns. I think last time I checked on their pronouns. Um, and then they also had, 
they were part of the villa. So I'm curious about S.L. Wong. I did read A Dream of Electric Mothers, which was in Africa Risen, and this one was an interesting thought experiment of if you have your community when everyone's alive, their consciousness are kind of in, they're, they're always saved, and then when they died, that consciousness is added to a hive mind, essentially, and that's the electric mothers, and when you need to solve problems, the council can go there and ask their questions, and it's about this person doing that for a problem that they have, but also asking their own personal question about their familial stuff, and it was really lovely, really fascinating look at this way of using your ancestral knowledge with blended with technology. Super cool. Highly recommend. And then I don't know anything about the other two, The Prince of Salt and The Ocean's Bargain, and We Built This City. Although I like the song, We Built This City. I don't know if it's based off that. Um, both of the other two were in Uncanny and Clark's World, which are two magazines that are very loved among these boating circles. Um, I don't know anything about the short stories. I don't even recognize, I think, any of the authors. Um, so, yeah. And I didn't recognize any of the middle grade and young adult fiction. And, I mean, they have an award for outstanding dramatic presentation. And they have an, an episode of Andor, which I really liked. Everything Everywhere All at Once, which of course would get my vote because like I just freaking loved that movie. Like I don't think that's a hot take. I think that's a very lukewarm take of liking that movie. But I now have a poster for that movie that I adore that Ryan got me. It's kind of, I don't know if it's like a spoiler because it's an out of context spoiler poster. Like it's a very, like he went to find the screenshot that I really wanted. And I'm, I just really like it. Oh, it's a really good poster. Um, we have Nope, which I still need to see. I don't quite know if Our Flag Means Death counts as like speculative, but I did really like that show. Um, the Sandman season one, I didn't finish it because I kind of got bored. <laughs> I thought the pacing of that show was really odd um, for, for episodes. And then Severance, I really do want to watch that when I have Apple TV again. Um, and then there are video games. Uh, the only one I remotely have opinions are, are Stray and Horizon Forbidden West. I haven't played either of them, but Stray has a cat in a, like a dystopian world, and that's really cool. And then I have been loving Horizon Zero Dawn, and I can only imagine I'm also going to love Horizon Forbidden West. Um, Elden Ring is also on here, which I have not played, but I've seen Ryan play. And I'm not going to lie. I mean, I think it's, is this a hot take? I think it's really boring world building and story creation. Like the art is obviously the art is spectacular and the world is vast, but like, it's really hard to keep track of who is who because of the voice actors being so samey. And although technically people are, you know, of different skin colors ish, it just all feels the same. It's there's a lot of sameness for me. Um, obviously, the big bosses, the monsters are like exquisitely done. But like keeping track of the plot of that game is just so obtuse. I don't know. It's it's, it's a good game if you like challenging things and if you want an open world to explore. But I just think plot wise, world building wise, it's only okay. That's my opinion. I just think it's only okay. Um, so yeah, but I say that also not having played it, but like legitimately I, I would ask all the time, like, wait, why are we talking to her? What's happening? It's so hard. It's so difficult. Um, not just to play, but to keep track of why you're doing whatever you're doing. Like other than it will give you experience points to then be better. And you know, like besides your own personal motivation to finish the game. But those are my thoughts on the nebula. And I am excited to start getting my head around what I want to nominate for the Hugos because we have till the end of April. I have finally gotten my email about that and it should be good. I read a lot of releases last year. I'll have my tier ranking of new releases if you want to see that down below. So I'm curious what I'm going to pull from that when I think about what I would like to see awarded. Again, there's no metric. I think the only rules is that they had to have been published last year. So yeah. But let me know what you think about these awards, the nominations, what you agree with, don't agree with, etc. If you want to leave an emoji, leave a cat because we talked about the video game Stray. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!